Good afternoon. I am Dr. Nancy Parsley, Provost of RFU, and it is my sincere pleasure to welcome you to the seventh annual Women in Science and Healthcare Symposium. It is wonderful to be back on campus with our participants after two years of continuing this tradition online. I also extend a warm welcome to all those who are joining us virtually from far and wide through this year's hybrid format. The WISH Symposium began in 2016 with an examination of gender bias in biomedical research and healthcare. Our inaugural gathering in each symposium since have signaled a renewed commitment to the advancement of women in the biomedical, healthcare, and academic workforce. At Rosalind Franklin University, that commitment is resolute. It is a testament to our namesake, Dr. Rosalind Franklin, whose discoveries and crucial contributions to industry, science, and human health went unrecognized until four decades after her untimely death. The discrimination she faced should have been unacceptable 70 years ago, and it certainly should be cast aside wherever it remains in the 21st century. In honor of Dr. Franklin, who had to fight for funding and salary increases for herself and her teams, despite the success of their projects, we dedicate ourselves to celebrating and supporting women in STEM. We are determined to advocate for gender equality through education, action, and vigilance. Through the efforts of everyone involved in the WISH Symposium and similar initiatives, both nationally and globally, we look forward to a time when progress overtakes the remaining challenges and professional respect for women in science and healthcare becomes a cultural standard. You will hear today from an impressive panel of experts who will underscore the importance of recognizing and respecting sex, gender, and race in medicine and science. Let me offer my personal gratitude, not only for your participation today, but for your dedication to the WISH Symposium vision. It is an honor to be here with you. Now, please allow me to turn our program over to Dr. Lee Elliott, a driving force behind the WISH Symposium and a nationally recognized expert on brain and gender development. Please welcome Dr. Elliott. Thank you, Dr. Parsley, and good afternoon to our participants both here and streaming. My name is Lise Elliott, and I'm a neuroscientist and executive chair of the Department of Foundational Sciences and Humanities at Chicago Medical School. On behalf of my co-chairs, Christine Burgess, Bruce Sowers, and our outstanding WISH team, I wanna thank you for joining us in what I'm sure will be an important seminar and lively discussion. We inaugurated the WISH seminar seven years ago with the aim of celebrating our namesake and highlighting the promise and struggles for women in science and healthcare. Ever since 2004, when the university was renamed in her honor, Rosalind Franklin has become an inspiration for all who walk through these doors. Despite the sexism and anti-Semitism of her day, Rosalind's passion passionate and meticulous scientific endeavors led to a remarkable number of biophysical discoveries in her tragically short career. The fact that her contributions were ignored for decades only magnifies our commitment to honor her legacy every day through our research, teaching, and clinical endeavors. But these are hard careers and harder still for those who do not fit the Watson Crick Wilkins model. I'm sure Rosalind would be thrilled to see so many women today in science and healthcare, but she'd also see some familiar patterns, the bias, underestimation, and casual exclusion that continue to diminish the contributions and advancement of women and non-white scientists and clinicians. Each year, the WISH Symposium explores these problems from a different angle, putting one element under the microscope as our iconic photograph of Rosalind depicts. In 2016, we started with a deep dive on gender bias in science and healthcare. The next year, we turned to gender segregation in health professions. 
and the impact of our ubiquitous social divides on women's advancement and women's health. Over subsequent years, we've examined sexual harassment, the intersection of sexism and racism, and on a positive note, the opportunities that arise when we use gender as a starting point for new innovations in science and healthcare. This year's theme hit us like a bolt of lightning on June 24th, 2022 when the US Supreme Court overruled Roe v. Wade and half the population suddenly lost a profound constitutional right, we knew we had to put the issue of women's bodily autonomy under the microscope. Around the world, women's bodies are policed, controlled, mutilated, raped, imprisoned, and killed for no other reason than their sex at birth or gender identity. Compared to the morality police in Iran, the Taliban prohibition of Afghani girls' education, the war crimes in Ukraine and Ethiopia, and the femicide epidemic exploding across Latin America, our gender, our gender troubles here in the US may seem minor, but they stem from similar presumptions of inferiority and subordination that we will address today. The topic of women's bodies has been foremost in the work of our keynote speaker, Dr. Paula Johnson, who it gives me great pleasure to welcome to RFU. I first discovered Dr. Johnson when we were planning our 2019 symposium on sexual harassment. As lead author on the National Academy seminal report, Sexual Harassment in Academic Science, Engineering and Medicine, Dr. Johnson is an expert on the effects of gender harassment sexual coercion and unwanted sexual attention on women's attrition and advancement across the spectrum of STEM careers. That report, which was disseminated under the hashtag science2 moniker, took a deep and rigorous dive into the prevalence and impact of all these forms of harassment and concluded with thoughtful and overdue prescriptions for system-wide change. In addition to this pivotal work, Dr. Johnson's contributions span many other areas relevant to women's bodies, including reproductive rights, and advising the NIH on racial, ethnic, and gender disparities in health and disease. Between her scholarship, clinical practice, and administrative experience, Dr. Johnson is uniquely poised to address the two themes of our symposium today, women's health and women's leadership. So let me properly uh, introduce Dr. Johnson. Um, Dr. Paula Johnson, who is a cardiologist, epidemiologist, and the 14th president of Wellesley College in Massachusetts. Born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, Dr. Johnson received her bachelor's, MD, and MPH degrees from Harvard University. She then completed her residency and cardiovascular fellowship at Harvard Brigham and Women's Hospital before joining the faculty of Harvard Medical School, where she was professor of medicine and professor of epidemiology in the T.H. Chan School of Public Health. At Brigham and Women, she led the development of the Connor Center for Women's Health and Gender Biology and served as its executive director for 15 years, building a novel division of women's health that trained faculty in research and clinical care across disciplines. Dr. Johnson is the recipient of numerous awards, including membership in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Medicine, induction into the International Women's Forum uh, Hall of Fame, and honorary doctorates from three universities. She's given talks around the globe on health equity, intimate partner violence, and especially women's health, including a 2014 TED Talk, His and Her Healthcare, with well over 1 million views. As president of Wellesley since 2016, Dr. Johnson has dedicated herself to creating the conditions that allow women to thrive, a goal that resonates deeply with our mission of wish and a legacy that Rosalind Franklin would no doubt be proud of. So please welcome, join me in welcoming Dr. Paula Johnson to our seventh annual WISH Symposium to present her, her keynote, Sex Does Matter, How Sex, Gender, and Race Impact Science and Medicine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Drs. Elliot and Parsley, um, and uh, Dr. Elliot for that generous introduction. And, it is truly uh, a pleasure to be here for uh, at this institution named for such an esteemed woman scientist. It's really been also a lovely day meeting uh, so many of your leadership and also spending time with your remarkably uh, terrific students who have many questions, many aspirations. And um, it was really exciting to be with those who are really the future of healthcare and of academic medicine. 
So today, uh, as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic, I really wanna discuss some of the great lessons that the pandemic has taught us about health disparities in the United States and the ways to ensure that our medical system from research to clinical care and policy becomes more equitable. When COVID-19 first had its frightening beginning um, in March of 2020, the New York State uh, State's Governor, Andrew Cuomo, um, who was grappling with the epicenter of the outbreak said, and he tweeted actually, the virus is the great equalizer. Well, he was mistaken. As we know, the old have been much more likely to die than the young. Black, Latinx, and American Indian and Alaska Native people have been roughly twice as likely to die as white people when the data, after the data are adjusted for age. And men have been more likely to die of COVID than women. But women who are pregnant, who have recently give, given birth, have been at greater risk for serious illness. In fact, our failure as a country to consider the possibility of highly unequal health outcomes held us back in understanding and fighting the virus from the earliest days, and that was at a tremendous cost. Yet we have a great opportunity to learn from this crisis. COVID-19 really revealed with a stark reality an essential truth about healthcare. Equal outcomes can only be achieved if system-wide there's a recognition of meaningful differences. That recognition is what I've been working towards my entire career, and it led me to combine cardiology with clinical epidemiology in order to research disparities based on sex and race. It also led me to found the Connor Center for Women's Health and Gender Biology at the Brigham and Harvard Medical School in 2002, as well as to relaunch a division of women's health. And in that role, I worked as, as, uh, as Lee said, for 15 years to improve the health of women and to transform their care through research. And this is what the wheel shows, through research, translating research to clinical care, influencing policy, and educating young leaders. We worked hard to change a medical and scientific culture that views men's biology and experiences as the normal and women's as a mere deviation from the norm. So as all of you know, men and women are not just different in their sex organs, but at a level of every single cell. And a landmark 2001 Institute of Medicine report entitled Exploring the Biologic Contributions to Human Health does sex matter? Coined the phrase, every cell has a sex. As a result of these fundamental cellular differences, women's brains are different, their hearts, their lungs, and their immune systems are different. Pharmaceuticals act differently in men and women. Diseases manifest themselves differently. The most famous example occurs in my own field of cardiology. Myocardial infarction or heart attacks can present differently in women, often without chest pain. But because men's symptoms have been considered the standard for so long, both patients and physicians may miss the signs in women. And this is still happening in 2022. Women's lives are also different. When these genetic and physiologic differences interact with the hormonal and reproductive changes that take place across a woman's lifespan, they have ripple effects on every aspect of her health. If we fail to take into account these realities, considering men always as the default, we are leaving women's health to chance. Yet all too often, physicians and scientists fail to incorporate the fundamental truth into research and clinical care. While sex is a biologic distinction, social distinctions have also had tremendous influence on health outcomes. These include gender identity, as well as race and ethnicity. So while today I am going to discuss sex on the binary, my points will reinforce the need for more research on gender impacts as well, including research on transgender populations. This pandemic has taught us one thing very clearly, told us one thing very clearly. 
we have to pay attention to the social and environmental determinants of health. As you can see, there have been extreme variations in COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations and deaths across racial and ethnic groups. And these numbers that you see here, you don't have to focus on them. These are compared with the white population. And these variations were more extreme before vaccinations were widely available. In fact, a Washington Post analysis published last week found that at the end of last year, the racial disparities in COVID deaths had vanished as white death rates rose because of vaccine refusal. Important to continue the measurement. There are many likely contributors to cumulatively poorer outcomes during the pandemic for people of color. Greater exposure to the virus on the job, and these jobs could not be done at home. Comorbidities such as diabetes and obesity, more crowded living conditions, and the lack of health insurance. However, an early study by researchers at the MIT Sloan School of Management found that at the county level, the higher the percentage of black residents, the higher the death rate. And this was even after variables such as income, rates of diabetes and obesity, public transit use, and health insurance coverage were adjusted for. Clearly, other factors are involved, including discrimination in healthcare delivery itself. A better healthcare system, one that serves all of us, requires three things. First, we need research that accounts for both the biologic differences between women and men and the social and environmental factors that often determine health outcomes. Second, we need clinical care to incorporate and reflect these research findings. And third, we need health policies and leadership that support the larger goal of equity in our society. So there's a reason why research comes first on my list. It informs every other aspect of our healthcare system, or it should at least. When research is inadequate or misleading, it distorts decision-making throughout the system. That's been the case for women's health for far too long. To appreciate where we are today, it helps to actually think about the history, which isn't all that long ago. Until the 1990s, women were routinely excluded from most medical research. Investigators operated under the assumption that what was true for men was generally true for women. And after thalidomide, a drug prescribed to pregnant women for morning sickness, turned out to cause terrible birth defects the FDA not only banned pregnant women from becoming, from being included in most clinical research, but it banned almost all women capable of becoming pregnant out of an excessive paternalistic concern. The cost of leaving women out of clinical research was high. Consider that uh, the 10 prescription drugs that were withdrawn from the market by the FDA between 1997 and 2001, of those 10, eight had more severe health effects on women. In addition, diseases that were more prevalent in women were largely ignored. In 1990, just 13% of the National Institutes of Health budget was devoted to women's health risks. Congressman Pat Schroeder, a leader in this front, said it was the famous 1980s physician's health study from my home institution, which found that taking aspirin daily would prevent heart attacks. That tipped her off to a problem of sex bias in medical research. Every single one of the 22,000 physicians included in the clinical trial was a man. The findings were presented as if they were universally true, but were they? Well, we all know now, it took 16 years to find out. In 2005, aspirin was shown by the Women's Health Study to reduce the incidence of strokes in women, but not heart attacks. And now the science has moved on and aspirin is now recommended for the primary prevention of heart attacks in younger adults only on a case-by-case -case basis and for those over 60, not at all. 
1990, the Congressional Caucus for Women's Issues asked the Government Accountability Office, or the GAO, to take a look into the exclusion of women from medical research performed by the NIH. The GAO found and reported that the NIH was in fact violating its own policies. Then in 1991, there was a watershed event. The Senate Judiciary Committee hearings at which Anita Hill accused the Supreme Court nominee Clarence Thomas of workplace harassment and was not treated, for those of you in the room who remember watching the hearings, was not treated particularly well by the white male senators questioning her. A lot of American women woke up then to the injustices they were experiencing. It was not unlike the moment in 2017 when women became, uh, be started coming forward with allegations against Harvey Weinstein and so many others in the Me Too movement, which the Me Too became a rallying cry. In 1992, women were swept into Congress, including four new women senators. By 1993, Pratt Schroeder led a bipartisan group of women legislators. I wanna focus bipartisan group of women legislators who ensured that the NIH Revitalization Act included a mandate that women and minorities be included in phase three clinical trials. This law was important and slowly the science improved. We began assembling a growing body of evidence that heart disease, lung cancer, depression, and Alzheimer's all take different courses in women when compared with men. But it was still too early to declare victory. In 2014, our research group at the Connor Center in partnership with the Kaiser Family Foundation and the Jacobs Institute for Women's Health produced an evidence-based policy report entitled Sex-Specific Medicine, Sex-Specific Medical Research, Why Women's Health Can't Wait. And the purpose of the report was to identify the remaining gaps in scientific research pertaining to sex. 21 years after the 1993 Revitalization Act, the NIH was still not falling, not fully living up to its policies. Among the list of problems we flagged, two stand out. First, even when women were included in clinical trials, the vast majority of federally funded studies still did not report sex specific findings. In this slide, you can see that of the studies on the treatment of coronary artery disease published up until 2011, the vast majority that included women, so these are all studies that included women, the vast majority did not report the results by sex, and that's the pink bars compared with the blue bars. Given the biological importance of sex, when you give an average as a result, quite frankly, it is neither good for women or men. The second problem we flagged was that in basic and preclinical research, the vast majority of studies continued to be focused on male animals and paid little to no attention to the sex of cells. Without sex as a variable, what you have is poor science. So here's how Pat Schroeder described the lagging NIH. And I quote, she said, it reminds me of when you ask your children to move the clothes from the washer to the dryer, then you go back and the clothes are still wet and they say, well, you didn't tell me to turn the dryer on. <laughs> so it took the GAO report and another act of Congress in late 2016, not that long ago, the 21st Century Cures Act and the 21st Century Cures Act before the NIH began insisting that clinical trial results be reported by sex and race. Just as important, in 2016, the NIH finally let it be known that it expected sex as a biologic variable to be factored into the design, collection, analyses, and reporting of all the studies that it supports, including basic science. 
Even asking the question, what does sex mean for this study, is going to lead us in important and new directions. But we still have to overcome a lot of scientific ignorance to make this policy meaningful. A excuse me, a survey of NIH study section members shortly after the policy was put in place found that some of these reviewers considered the policy, and I quote, nonsensical, a waste of time, or a non-scoring factor in grant applications. Well, sex does matter. We need a thoughtful consideration of meaningful differences throughout the entire research and biomedical innovation ecosystem, including in medical journals and by pharmaceutical companies and device makers. And of course, these factors should be included in public health data as well. Yet in our chaotic decentralized system, and believe me, I use the word system liberally here, of healthcare data gathering, data are still not routinely stratified by sex and race, and COVID-19 pointed out the costs. The New York Times had to file a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit in the spring of 2020 to get the CDC to release data about race and ethnicity in COVID cases, which revealed grossly disproportionate infection rates for Black and Hispanic people. COVID also rem reminded us that we are not fully recognizing the totality of women's lives in clinical research. The routine exclusion of pregnant women from clinical trials may have been expedient in getting emergency authorization for the COVID-19 vaccines, but it left pregnant women and other people who can become pregnant at sea when it came to deciding whether to be vaccinated. When the CDC finally issued a health advisory for pregnant women in September of 2021, urging vaccination, just 31% of pregnant women in the United States had been vaccinated and just 16% of pregnant black women. So while research is crucial to making healthcare more equitable, there is no guarantee that it will have an impact. And that depends entirely on what we do with it. Which brings me to my second point, the need for healthcare to incorporate and reflect these research findings. The translation of research to care could be the subject of a series of lectures on its own. So please allow me to offer two what I think are pretty scorching examples. Research into reproductive health and cardiovascular health has told us that seeing women's health across the lifespan is essential. That discrete conditions experienced many years apart are in fact connected, even though these two fields generally exist in their own silos. Research has also taught us that cardiometabolic disorders of pregnancy, such as preeclampsia and gestational diabetes, are risks for cardiovascular disease as women age. When you add these risks to preterm delivery and low birth weight, a woman's risk of developing cardiovascular disease over a lifetime doubles. At the same time, we know that at least part of the reason we're seeing increasing rates of maternal mortality and morbidity in the US is that some of these same cardiometabolic factors, including hypertension of pregnancy, can be associated with dire outcomes. General internists, cardiologists, and obstetricians and gynecologists need to pay attention to young women at risk. But the statistics tell us this has not been happening. The United States has the dubious distinction of having the highest maternal mortality rate amongst high income countries. And that is mainly because black women fare so badly, and that's the 55.3, uh, black women fare so badly dying of pregnancy related complications at nearly three times the rate of white women. Black women also have higher rates of severe maternal morbidity, 
They're 50% more likely to have premature births than white women. And infant mortality amongst black babies is more than twice that of white babies. These gaps persist at all levels of education and income. And in fact, one study suggests that the gap between black and white women in terms of births, may, uh, black and white births may even be larger for women with college degrees. So now we have made some inroads in translating what we know from research to care. The American Heart Association guidelines for the prevention of heart disease in women recognizes that cardiometabolic disorders of pregnancy is a, as a, a female specific risk. We have national campaign, campaigns to improve awareness amongst women. And there have been positive advances in policy. I had the honor of serving on the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, on the committee that developed the evidence-based recommendations for preventative services for women under the Affordable Care Act. We included early screening for gestational diabetes, which along with high blood pressure, preeclampsia and preeclampsia, puts pregnant women at high risk. But for all this avowed progress, we still don't seem to be making as much progress as we would hope. Black maternal mortality rose 48% between 2018 and 2020. And COVID may send the 2021 numbers still higher when they become available. We still don't fully understand what is driving these poor outcomes for Black women. What are the compounding factors when women are both battling sexism and racism. This phenomenon has really been getting much long overdue public attention, thanks to groundbreaking reporting such as that in the New York Times Magazine a cover story by Linda Villarosa as to the harrowing first, uh, harrowing, uh, first person stories from regular women, but also from celebrities such as Serena Williams and Beyonce. In her 2018 book, Doing Harm, journalist Maya Dusenberry points to two interlocking problems that have undermined women's health care. The first she calls the knowledge gap, the fact that health care providers simply don't know enough about women's health. The second she terms the trust gap, the fact that providers often discount women's reports of their own symptoms and conditions. Women are not often considered reliable reporters of their own symptoms. And if you haven't read this, this article, I would go back and read it. And actually Linda Villarosa has a brand new book out that includes a number uh, of pieces that are worthwhile reading. During COVID, there have been many stories of women of color finding their symptoms discounted in clinical settings. And at Wellesley, we are still mourning Zoe Mungan, a 30 year old, Black school teacher in Brooklyn and an alumna. She was twice turned away from the hospital without a COVID test in March of 2020, even though she had the standard symptoms of COVID. Instead, she was told that she might be having a panic attack or asthma. The third time she came back to the hospital, she was put on a ventilator and died a few weeks later. These stories are a wake up call for all of us in higher education and in medicine. We clearly need to teach the next generation of healthcare professionals about the ways that hasty judgments and implicit bias can undermine the care they give their patients, potentially with grave outcomes. We also need to do much more to educate healthcare professionals about how sex differences influence the presentation of disease. We need to help them understand that race and ethnicity are not biologic different differentiators, but instead are very imprecise stand-ins for ancestry and genotype, and that they should not confuse the prevalence of a disease in a certain group with a predisposition to it. Instead, confronted with health disparities, they should be ready to consider environmental, institutional, and societal factors, including structural racism. Unfortunately, 
in America in 2022. It takes courage to advocate for the consider consideration of meaningful differences. In Boston alone, neo-Nazis have targeted two physicians at my former institution, Brigham and Women's Hospital, who were doing outstanding work on racial disparities, particularly in the care of heart failure patients. And we have seen protests and threats of all kinds against Boston Children's Hospital for, provide, for providing services to transgender children. Without consideration of the biologic and social differentiators in health and disease, we are only serving a small fraction of our population well. The third thing we need for better health outcomes for women and minorities is healthcare policies that support equity. Because again, even the most advanced healthcare means nothing to someone who can't receive it. Without a question, the Affordable Care Act has dramatically advanced access to health insurance and healthcare and has been particularly important for women. Before the ACA, and I think this is always important for younger women to remember because they have no recollection of this. But before the ACA, many individual plans did not even include maternity care and pregnancies could be treated as pre-existing conditions used to deny women coverage. And there's a whole lot more I could list. However, we all know the tenuousness of these gains and how incomplete, given the fact that a significant percentage of our population is still uninsured. The lack of expansion of federally covered Medicaid in so many states is again, a topic for another talk. And as we heard earlier, um, after the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs v. Jackson's Women's Health Organization, we now live in a fractured country in terms of policy, one where women's right to make her own medical decisions is severely limited in many states and where doctors now fear terminating a pregnancy even to save a woman's life. The pandemic has also shown us as a nation that we need to focus on and invest in our patchwork of public health infrastructure in prevention, and in the health of our entire population, and not just on healthcare delivery in the one-to-one -one model. A lack of public health infrastructure is not just a problem in a pandemic. If we look at health in the context of populations, we're able to make connections between the overall environment and the one-to-one -one healthcare, and consider why the US is doing so poorly in terms of outcomes and disparities. Just consider that the life expectancy at birth of a white man is now 73.7 years, for a black man, 66.7 years, and for an American Indian or Alaska native, 61.5 years. We're a nation where inequalities in housing, in environmental exposures, in education, in employment opportunities, and so much else manifest themselves in the form of physical suffering and shortened lives. So how can we ensure more equitable policies? Well, who you are influences what you see. To be honest, we need more women and more underrepresented minorities in positions of leadership, in science, in medicine, in academia, in biotechnology, in the pharmaceutical uh, industry, and in politics. It's no coincidence that the push to require federally funded studies to take sex into account was spearheaded by women, Pat Schroeder, and then state, uh, and then Representative Olympia Snow, Senator and Senator Barbara uh, Mikulski, among others. In research, it's no surprise that an analysis of 11.5 million health sciences publications between 1980 and 2016 found that studies with female first or last authors were more likely to report research findings by sex. 
And when women can innovate in healthcare, it's important for women. I think of Bloomer Tech, a, co a company that was co-founded by three women, which addresses the fact that metal de medical devices such as heart monitors, and if anyone has ever known, worn one, you understand what I'm talking about, are designed for men. They're bulky and uncomfortable. And Bloomer Tech has developed washable, flexible Bluetooth sensors to measure heart and lung function that can be embedded in a bra. We need many more such sex-specific innovations. Maybe we could start with mammogram machines, which is why it's so disheartening that in 2021, just 2% of venture capital went to startups led by women. So we need more women at the tables where investment decisions are made as well. Because when women control the money, female founders get funded. Clearly a crisis like COVID-19 demonstrates the value of the full talent pool getting involved. On the research side, women and women of color were absolutely key to the development of the COVID vaccines, including Dr. Kazmikia Corbett of the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, who helped to forward the speedy development of the Moderna vaccine while at the NIH, Dr. Oslem Terechi, who led the development of the Pfizer vaccines, as Chief Medical Officer of Bio and Tech, and Dr. Caitlin Carrico, uh, who conducted the foundational research for the modified messenger RNA on which both of these vaccines are based. At the same time, as COVID-19 showed us why we need women in STEM, it also directed a harsh light on the challenges faced by women in STEM. In 2021, a National Academies report focused on the impact of COVID-19 on the careers of women in academic sciences, engineering, and medicine. It catalogs the struggles that range from the sudden expansion of women's faculty members' unequal second shift responsibilities at schools and childcare centers as they closed, to the extreme burnout being experienced by those on the front lines of healthcare, women who are generally younger, less well-paid and asked to work harder and given less support than their male counterparts. But COVID-19 has only worsened pre-existing gender inequalities in the academic sciences, engineering and medicine, not changed their character or their fundamental unfairness. As an example, last year I co-authored a paper that demonstrated uh, that article peer reviewers in the health sciences are biased against studies focused on women. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, such studies are more likely to be conducted by women. Even though the reviewers found that the studies that focused on women more likely to contribute to medical science, they were nonetheless twice as likely to recommend for publication the same research conducted in men. We had a number of different um, uh, 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 entries um, that, were, uh, that were just changed with regard to gender, but they told the same story. Unfortunately, publication bias is far from the worst insult experienced by women in STEM fields. There's a gender gap in pay, and I know you've had a speaker focused on that, and promotions, and there's is sexual harassment, which we heard about earlier. In 2018, I was co-chair of a National Academies Committee report that reported on sexual harassment of women in academic science, engineering, and medicine. We found that STEM academic workplaces are only second to the military in rates of sexual harassment, second to the military. This is shocking, only if you consider it hastily. These are both environments where men outnumber women, and where leadership is dominated by men, and such environments tend to foster sexual harassment. Frankly, as all of us in higher education work so hard to bring young women into science, engineering, and medicine, it's beyond discouraging to think that they're being harassed out of those fields. Our report provided a number of evidence-based recommendations to prevent sexual harassment, including diffusing the traditional hierarchical dependent relationships between trainees and faculty. 
And it's encouraging finally to see some action on the legislative front. As of March, we have an essential new federal law that ends the secrecy that protects perpetrators of sexual assault and harassment by ending forced arbitration in employment contracts. In addition, the Chips and Science Act of 2022 has directed the National Science Foundation to continue our work by asking the National Academies to conduct a follow-up study on sexual harassment. Where are we going? Where are we today? And it requires the Office of Science and Technology Policy to coordinate the efforts of federal research agencies to reduce sexual harassment involving federally funded researchers and to develop uniform policy guidelines for them, which has not been the case. So ultimately, one of the great lessons of the pandemic is that as a society, we can't leave equity to chance in any realm. COVID-19 offered an extreme test of many of our society's structures and systems and gave us the gift of a new perspective on the ways that they disadvantage women and minorities. By showing us injustices too blatant to ignore, SARS-CoV-2 might indeed be the great equalizer, not as an agent of infection, but as a force of history. As I've argued today in healthcare, better outcomes overall can only be achieved if there's a recognition of meaningful differences in research, in clinical care, in public health, and in policy. At Rosalind Franklin University, both the faculty and the students have important roles to play in illuminating these differences and ensuring that an awareness of them leads to more compassionate, evidence-based care for all. And I can tell you, listening to your students, that is clearly a priority. When we consider and uncover the distinctions that determine the course of health and disease, we are giving injustice no place to hide. We're facing up to the problems that count, and we are putting the United States on the road to a healthier, more equitable, and more resilient society. So as a country, we should do better, and I would venture to say we must do better, and we know that we can. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Johnson. Wow. <laughs> you covered a tremendous amount of ground. Um, we have uh, maybe five minutes or so we can take uh, questions from the audience. We do have one question from the Zoom audience, and then we'll take a break, and then there'll be more opportunity for questions uh, after the panel discussion. Um, anyone in the live audience care to ask a question right now? Well, I'll start then with um, our, uh, our Zoom uh, contributor, Elena Barbato, who is actually our director for Title IX. I, I'm probably botching her title exactly. Title, but it's probably Title IX and non-discrimination. Yes, yes. Um, she says, I strongly support your work underscoring gender bias in medicine, but how can the Title IX office be of best service in this area? You know, I think, and, and again, I wanna focus on um, Gender, um, it's Title IX and non-discrimination. And um, I think the way that we have approached issues of sexual harassment, and that includes gender harassment. So what's the difference? Actually, the vast majority of sexual harassment is gender harassment, which is, I, I like to say, it's kind of the put downs as opposed to the come ons. And um, what we do know is that consistent or you know, kind of consistent gender harassment has the same impact as the most severe um, sexual uh, harassment or assault. Um, so what can you do? I think the way that we have traditionally approached these issues is by looking at that very tip of the iceberg and that's where the work lives. So the most egregious offenders are viewed as you know, those to address and then you're, you're you, you feel like you're dealing with the problem. So that's really not the case. Uh, usually 
that is the tip of the iceberg. And if you look at the report, we have kind of the iceberg and what's under the water. Um, and so where Title IX, I think, can help is really to change with your leadership, because it can't be Title IX alone, but it's with your leadership, to really think deeply about the culture, to think about what are the strategies we can put in place to not um, just punish or get the most egregious offenders, but to change the culture so that we actually prevent this type of harassment from occurring. And that is really what the report focuses on. And I do think that our Title IX uh, and non-discrimination officers can be very helpful in doing a number of trainings, not just on the legalistic aspects, but, but what does it mean to really be inclusive? How can we think differently? And again, leadership must buy into this because without leadership, there will be no change. Um, any, any other questions? Yes, Carl. Thank you very much for your, um, your presentation. Uh, very much appreciated and welcome to RFU. A couple of years ago, we had um, Dr. Michelle Morse um, at, when she was at Brigham Women's Hospital uh, speak about her work um, that you mentioned, that you referred to. I mean, you're talking, thank you very much for bringing that up. Uh, my question is, um, for those of us that have colleagues that deny the existence of structural sexism and or structural racism, what guidance do you have for us in engaging them? So, you know, I think this is not about changing hearts and minds that are dug into a particular place. I don't think actually that's gonna be helpful because um, when people are dug in, it's not clear to me why they are, but, um, but what we really wanna do is get to all those around them. And by changing the way we do things, by changing the way we speak about research, by changing the way we talk about the provision of healthcare, by changing with your colleagues, how you consider or, or analyze whether there are structural barriers, that will, will maybe bring others along and they'll choose whether to not come along or to come along. And the way that I tend to think about this is I remember when I first started uh, the Connor Center when we, our CEO and my department chair, Victor Zhao, who's now head of the National Academies, we, we worked on launching this together. And I would sit with various department chairs. And there were some department chairs who totally glazed over. There were some department chairs who really didn't believe in what I was talking about. But you know, my goal wasn't necessarily to convince them. My goal was to let them know, to see where we might meet at some place of understanding and to also understand what I could do for them in terms of their world. And it's so interesting because I would say probably 10 years after we started, there were people who I remember highly skeptical who were some of our biggest supporters. And I think that change is not something that happens overnight and we can't be dogmatic about change. It's a process and it's a process that takes a, it takes a long time. If you just think about the timeline I shared with you and where we got to in 2016 and we're not there yet. Um, I'm not saying that we should wait another 20 years, but what I do think is that we have to get to those who are flexible and who can come along for the journey and hopefully that they lead the crest of the wave for everyone else. Well, thank you so much. Uh, let's all take a five minute break and then we will reconvene with a panel to continue our discussion of women's health and women's leadership. All right, welcome back to the seventh Women in Science and Healthcare Symposium, Women's Bodies Under the Microscope. I'm Christine Burgess, Assistant Professor and Director of Didactic Education from the Rosalind Franklin University of Medicine and Science Physician Assistant Program and the co-chair, uh, one of the co-chairs for the Women in Science and Healthcare Symposium. And then I'm honored to serve as today's uh, moderator for our panel. 
I'd first like to thank Dr. Paula A. Johnson, president of Wellesley College for her impactful keynote, um, Sex Does Matter, How Sex, Gender, and Race Impact Science and Medicine. It's my pleasure to, to welcome back Dr. Johnson for our panel discussion from Subject to Investigator, Centering Women in Science and Medicine. I'd now like to introduce our other panelists for today. First, Dr. Wendy Rowe, who is our president and CEO at Rosalind Franklin University of Medicine and Science, as well as a professor in the physical therapy and interprofessional education departments. In addition to her current role as the president, Dr. Rowe has served in many positions at the university, including the university's first provost and the dean of the College of Health Professions. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Rowe. Next is Dr. Holly Hunsberger, Assistant Professor of Neuroscience in the Foundation Sciences and Humanities Division of the Chicago Medical School. Dr. Hunsberger is a researcher on the effects of sex differences and anxiety and Alzheimer's disease. Welcome, Dr. Hunsberger. And then finally, Dr. Bianna Kotler, um, Clinical Science Education for Psychiatry at the Chicago Medical School. She pr practices psychiatry at Captain James A. Lovell Federal Health Care Center and is also the founding president of the Chicago Medical, chapter, Chicago Medical School chapter of Women in Medicine and Science. Thank you for being here today, Dr. Kotler. And um, we are going to get started with our panel. So we're going to do a variety of different um, topics today. Um, first, we'll start off specifically regarding women's health questions, and then we'll hopefully move into some leadership questions as well. So my first question is actually for Dr. Johnson. Um, I'd love to hear some comments on the ways in which diversity can improve science, not only with regards to who is making discoveries, but also regarding what and whom they are studying. So thank you, and it's it's wonderful to to be with with all of you um, this afternoon. You know, I always say, um, and I mentioned earlier, who you are really influences what you see, and I think that is the foundational importance of diversity, which is that without diversity of all types at any table, we are really not. Um, making the most of scientific inquiry um, at all levels, whether it's basic, whether it's uh, clinical. Um, each person, as they think through the lens of their own background, will be able to bring a different way of thinking to the table that is critically important. You know, one of the examples that I that I usually give is that of who stratifies data, and a very large study looking just at at what types of authors stratify data by sex, which means you're actually getting sex specific data, much more likely to be women authors. Um, and I could go on about different ways of looking at things, but even asking the question in basic science. Um, what was the sex of those cells? Um, or in clinical medicine, what is the context of life of the populations that you're looking at? And how should we be thinking about adding various variables into any given study? So without that, we aren't taking advantage of the richness of what science can produce. And quite frankly, I think we aren't really living up to the promise of science, and we're also not making the most of the funding that is available. So what I would really hope is that this becomes a much larger public issue, which it hasn't over the past years, because if you think about the amount of federal funding that this country allots, if you thought about the fact that that funding was not really being utilized to its fullest extent, that is not a good message, but we have the ability to turn that around. Thank you. Would anybody else on the panel have anything to add? Nothing to do. All right, we can move on. I have a follow-up question. And um, this one's actually gonna start with Dr. Hunsberger. Um, where do you see the greatest impact of studying animal sex differences for advancing human health? Yes, so the easy answer is that we can 
more easily manipulate rodents. Um, and so we can test pregnant mice, we're allowed to do that, and we can include all types. Um, and so that's the easy answer. Um, when I started, I did not start looking at sex differences. Um, so in my, I started in grad school, uh, we just had female mice. Um, it just happened that way. And then when I started my postdoc, I noticed that everything had been published in male mice. And so I, I simply asked my advisor, what does this look like in female mice? What does Alzheimer's disease look like in female mice? And she said, we're not even breeding female rodents. Um, so they weren't even breeding them at the time. And this was right before the SABV initiative in 2016, the sex as a biological variable. And so that really started me down this path of questioning sex differences in disease states and mood disorders and just this trajectory of women's health that basically exploded around the time of my postdoc experience. So um, now I'm interested in the aging trajectory, um, looking at menopause transition. And so rodent models really enable us to dissect apart um, how hormones play a role. Um, we can look at manipulating brain circuits. And I think it really, beyond manipulations, we can find novel areas that we wouldn't be able to do um, in big human clinical data sets. And so that's kind of where my research is looking novel regions that are affected in women. We know that aging and Alzheimer's all ends the same, male, female, transgender, non-binary, but the way that we get there is probably different. And so I think the advantage is finding these different pathways, which are largely conserved across species, uh, and finding novel therapeutics um, for men, for women, um, transgender, non-binary, um, and really creating this idea of personalized therapeutics. And I think um, rodents, uh, non-human primates uh, are really gonna be beneficial in this area and helpful. Great, thank you for sharing. Any other comments from the group? If not, I have a thought. Yeah, go ahead. I just wanna thank you for your work in Alzheimer's because you know, this is a dev. We all know, right? How many of, of family members have Alzheimer's? It's a devastating disease, and we know the disproportionate number of women who suffer from this disease. And it's not just because women live longer. And so, doing that foundational research is so important. And I just want to say thank you for asking that initial question. Absolutely, I thank you as well. So we'll move on. My next question is for Dr. Rowe. Where has women's health been most neglected and where has this movement been most successful? Yeah, uh, I think we heard some excellent examples um, in cardiology, for example, of how we are really thinking about women and how women react differently. One area that has been neglected, some research but neglected, is pain, right? There was a study that showed that in the ER, okay, women, uh, they wait an average of 65 minutes if they have acute abdominal pain compared to men who uh, wait an average of 49 minutes. That's 16 minutes difference, an average of. So we know that women, uh, they uh, experience pain differently. Biologically, it's different. We know that, that drugs, uh, we don't know enough about pain. And we know that there are more women that report pain than uh, men. Oftentimes, uh, women are given a sedative instead of pain medication. Um, and I, I think you can probably talk about psychiatry and, and histronics you know, and those, those kinds of things in terms of women. So I think that's been neglected. I also think that Education is an issue too, and uh, you, you, you know, touched on that, but we don't talk enough uh, in our educational programs for our healthcare professionals about sex differences, and um, and physicians working out there, they don't talk about it either because there hasn't been the research, and then the translation from research to to evidence uh, is is not there as well. So we know that we need to do a good job, a better job, uh, putting this content into our educational programs, both at the university level, but also residencies as well. So I, I think that is an area that really needs some, some work. Thank you. Yeah, I think there's a lot of assumptions that are made, especially around pain management. So I think that's important to, to bring 
forward. Um, I'd love to open for the group. Um, any opinions on where we've been maybe most successful, perhaps? Well, I think cardiology is done pretty well. Um, and also, I think breast cancer. I think cardiology is done well at a certain level. So we've done well with regard to differentiating symptoms, outcomes, certain risk factors, um, and certain more um, understanding of differences in physiology. What we don't understand is why. And that's the foundational underlying mechanisms of why we see these changes. Because until we understand what's driving what we are observing as changes, we actually aren't gonna be able to address it either from true prevention or from treatment. And you know, Rockefeller University uh, in New York is now, they have a, a, a major initiative on understanding the foundational mechanisms of sex differences. And I think that is, uh, if, you know, as they move forward, that's one place that will be focused on this. There are places across the country, um, but, but there just hasn't been enough work as to the why. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I think there are, have been good advances, obviously, but there's always more work, right? So, and then we kind of highlighted on my last question for this section, which is for Dr. Cutler, um, how does implicit bias impact women's health in um, each of your experiences? But we'll start with you, um, specifically for you looking at psychiatry. Thank you. I, I think that's such a, um, an important thing to look at. Psychiatry is supposed to be uh, way ahead of the game in implicit bias because we've been calling it by a different name for a really long time. Uh, countertransference. And unfortunately, um, we still see so many of those gender differences uh, still happening. You know, women are two times more likely to have depressive and anxiety disorders compared to men. And uh, I think a lot of it has to do with some of our ways of diagnosing and also interacting with patients. We create patterns in our minds and we try to get to that shortcut as quickly as possible to the conclusion. And we're starting to lose sight and hopefully we're getting back on track of finding out what those individual factors for the person in front of us actually are and individualizing that plan that we talked about today. Where women are catching up to men like substance use disorders, that's not necessarily a good thing, right? You're still dealing with all of those uh, issues as being in charge of uh, child care and then elderly care and then all of the household. And those are the stressors that can only worsen uh, mental health issues if we don't adequately address the individual in front of us and what they're dealing with. It's not enough to talk about um, the biology in terms of, uh, you know, here's the diagnosis, here's the medication, here's therapy. We really have to look at what are all of the other factors that are affecting our patient's mental health. Uh, it's really hard, but we have to look at the fact that, you know, they're doing more work for less pay. And how does that affect their mental health, right? Um, uh, you know, women are constantly put uh, at the uh, charge of their family household, despite also being expected to contribute financially. And that um, is making some of those underlying mental health issues uh, worse. And of course the pain, you know, making sure that we take care of women and believe them and understand that their experiences are real. Uh, we want to make sure, you know, we've come a long way. We no longer do hysterectomies for hysteria, but we still have a long, long way to go. Thank you. Yes. Anything from any of the other fields they'd like to share for that topic? Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so it's not only true for human patients, but I think in rodent research, people strayed away from using female mice um, because um, of the estrus cycle and the hormonal changes. And they said, well, it's gonna be costly. We have to add this whole other group um, and they're variable. They're creating all these variables. I'm like, 
as scientists, that's what we're supposed to be looking for and studying. So, um, so there has been a strong bias against using female rodents for a very long time. That's luckily changing now with the SAVV initiative, um, but still very underreported in publication. So although the grants are proposing the use of female rodents, um, they're not, um, they're either combining sexes, as you mentioned, or um, they're not reporting any differences at all. So, Thank you for that. Thank you. So now we're going to shift a little bit. I have some questions specifically regarding leadership. So those are going to start out with Dr. Rowe and Dr. Johnson, and then um, we'll move through those. And I have a couple for the group as well. So I'm actually going to start with Dr. Rowe. Um, so would you be able to articulate for us um, why a diverse workforce is better for healthcare and research? What is your role in ensuring this diversity as a leader? Well, I think our distinguished president also uh, talked about that. And um, I, I like the concept of who you are influences what you see. I love that. And um, and I hadn't thought about that, but it, I think it's a good thing for us to remember. We do know that a uh, diverse team, you know, when we looked at the interprofessional uh, research, they come up with a more creative solution. And it's the same with uh, diversity in terms of uh, your uh, workforce. Uh, there are a lot of our patients that want someone that looks like them, right? We've heard our patients tell us that. They tell us they want a, a woman physician. And so I think that that's an important consideration as well. Um, I, I can tell you a story based on our care coach. Many of you know that we have a care coach that uh, does a really good job of going out into the community and uh, seeing patients of color. Uh, they give them uh, vaccines, for example, during COVID. And there was a lot of vaccine hesitancy well, uh, Lupe, who's uh, the nurse practitioner on, on the care coach, she would park the care coach at the end of a street and she would go and knock on doors and she would be able to talk to patients in their language and explain to them what the vaccine was. She was very successful in getting them to accept the vaccine and, and taking the vaccine. So I think that's a, a win, an important part of having someone who is talking to the patient who speaks their language and uh, they can understand the reason for having the coach. So I think that's kind of a really uh, concrete example of, of why diversity is so important. Great, thank you for that story and big kudos to Lupe, of course. Thank you. Um, any follow-up? Okay, I have a question for Dr. Johnson. In your view, what are the biggest hurdles for women in ascending to leadership positions? Is the formula for successful leadership different for women? And how do you feel intersectionality also factors into the measure of success? Oh my. Lots of questions. I can repeat. Um, so what are some of the barriers? Um, you know, we know that some of the barriers are just the life circumstances of women, which is how do you combine your responsibilities that are frequently unequal with the expectations of the workplace and sometimes what is expected in the workplace to advance. And um, I think that that's a major issue and COVID has really brought that out loud and clear. You know, we, we've seen uh, the data of what happened in COVID in terms of turning the clock back from women is profound. So we're gonna see a lag in, for sure, in academia, both in academic medicine, but in more traditional academia. Um, and so that is one that is critically important. What can we do about that? Well, that's pretty complicated. Um, you know, we've got a societal problem that we've got to really work on, but some of the things we can think about in our own workplaces are um, ways to support women, um, what are some of the unintended consequences of some of the policies we put in place. And um, I'm not going to talk in generalities, but we do know, for example, in academia, some of the maternity slash paternity leave policies that we've put in place over the years have disproportionately um, favored men. Because if you have a disproportionate amount of work done at home, not every home, so I'm not talking about everyone here in the audience, but in a lot of homes, um, 
than, than when you have long paternity leaves, you have the partner who's not doing as much frequently being able to continue their research and do other things that advance their careers. So I think we have to think about some of the policies we have in place, not to say we shouldn't have paternity leave, but, but, but what are the right policies? I also think that we have to be thinking very clearly about trajectories. We know that if you think about the life cycle and childbearing, which a lot of the discrepancy becomes, comes really in the childbearing. If we take into account that there may be a delay or a different trajectory for women, then we have to build that into our notions of leadership and when we should be looking at women or continue to look at women for leadership. So in many places, you know, when you're in your 50s, like if you haven't done it, then might not happen. That should not be true. And in, in, the, in their 50s, women are frequently ready to hit the ground running. They're ready to take off. They're ready. I, one, one former faculty member, a colleague of mine used to call it the flash in the pan, which is you um, men's trajectories can frequently have a nice steady slope where women, you kind of not doing, you know, you're, you're kind of maybe in kind of rising, but then you hit that age, kids are gone. Okay, you're ready to take off. So we've got to factor that into who we look at and provide those really important opportunities um, for women. And then there are a whole number of other things. I mean, I talked about sexual harassment. I won't go there again, but it is a big deal. And we tend not to talk about it as much as part of the routine work that we do in changing culture. It tends to be looked at, as I said earlier, in this tip of the iceberg way. Um, and I, I could go on, but, but there are ways that we can look at these structural barriers and, um, and really work on them. And then lastly, I do wanna say how we support women um, and support them in a way that allows them to create networks is important. And this doesn't preclude men. Um, I mean, I think everyone needs camaraderie, networks, et cetera. But I do think given the trajectory of women, there's a way that we need to support our women in the workplace and particularly women who are underrepresented um, because those numbers are tiny. I would say all underrepresented people, but, but women in particular, tiny numbers. Um, and, and that might look different in different environments, but we have to pay attention to it. Yes, yes, that intersectionality is really important. Yes. Yeah, I wanna say something about networking. Um, networking can be harder for women, right? Because when are a lot of the events, they're at night. And if they have child care responsibilities, so we have to think of different ways, innovative ways for women to have networks, to have mentors. Uh, I think technology has helped us, right? Because we can do Zoom at, at certain hours of the day. But, you know, I have, I have a daughter who's got two kids and sometimes I think, oh my, what, what's, nothing's changed. What's happened? I mean, we've gone backwards. It's very frustrating. But um, I remember my own trajectory and it's exactly how you uh, talked about it. I was just kind of, you know, when, when the kids were there, I had to keep my head above water, right, with kids and a job. But then when the kids had more autonomy and were in high school and college, then I could really spend more time on my career. So I think that is a really important point is that we have to think of women and where they are in their trajectory and personalize it, mentor them, help them with networks. So I really appreciate what you said about um, thinking about women and where they are. Such an important topic. You know, one thing I do, what I did when I was in, when I had my division and center, as I did my faculty reviews every year, I asked the, the faculty, and, and we had predominance of women, what their, I, it's not, was not only about their academic trajectory. I would focus on that, um, but would also focus on their lives. So just tell me how are things going. And one of the interesting things I found in a newer, younger generation was that there was this idealized vision of what motherhood was. 
And I found younger women feeling that because we didn't talk about it as much, feeling that they had to be, now this may be controversial, but they had to be at every pickup, every drop off, every game, every everything. And that if they didn't do it, that in some way they were lesser than. And I think, I mean, unless you believe that, I think we have to work with young women and tell them that is just not true. And, and really it's, it's a personal choice, but it's a choice you should make because it's your choice, not because it means you are a lesser than mother. I mean, I would share, look, I think actually my kids, they actually thought that when I took them to school, it was something special because they didn't expect it. You know, there were ways that you did things that may not be right for every, because some people may love doing that. But if you don't, it really isn't going to psychologically damage your children for life. And I think we have to talk about these things. Thank you guys for, especially on the topic of motherhood. I feel like uh, that really resonates with me with having two young children or five and under. So thank you. And I'm sure for you as well. Yes, yes. Um, would you like to add anything? Go for it. I think um, these are all wonderful things. And as somebody who is trying to not delay my career till I'm 50, then do it all. I think creating those networking opportunities and ability to have those relationships that promote you between work hours instead of after um, would really go a long way. Um, and just creating a, a culture where you don't have to be there after 5 or 6 p.m. to have those opportunities. But I totally agree. You have to decide what's right for you and uh, what's really important, uh, both at work and both at home, and be okay with that. And sometimes enjoy a, an, an evening or two out. <laughs> it's very hard to find childcare still, I have to say, it is. during COVID. Yes, <laughs> and that's something. Yes. yes. Well, I just want to say one last thing, and that is my daughter was writing something that you said, and my mother worked and she went to every single event. And I don't know where she gets that from. <laughs> I was not at every single event. I pick and choose. It was a perception. Great. Thank you all for sharing. That was very helpful, I think, for a lot of people, especially me. So thank you. Um, I'd like to open this next question um, up to the entire group. It has a couple portions to it. So I'm going to read the whole thing and we can kind of pick which parts we want to talk about. So um, some people have had actually some of the um, opposite perceptions to our last question, which was more about like leadership, women in leadership um, and about um, the gender gaps um, specifically in business and STEM and that um, they say women actually get extra consideration um, and greater opportunity than um uh, than others, people who are equally equally qualified. Um, do you think that affirmative action has in some sense backfired for women or people of color, for example? Um, and how do you respond to those critics? I think the proof is in the pudding. Show me where we've reached equality. And then maybe we can look at those policies again. And I think no matter what area of STEM you're in, we're just not there. Um, and so that's all I have to say about it. I think you said it perfectly. Yeah, I Go gonna, for it. I'm in agreement. <laughs> I think we're all in agreement. Um, I mean, luckily here we have a lot of women in leadership roles, which is excellent, but that's not the case for a majority of places and universities, especially top tier universities and Ivy Leagues, which often suffer from an imbalance there. So yeah, I completely agree. Thank you. I mean, I, I totally agree with what's being said. And, um, but we are heading towards a, a, a really difficult time. So the Harvard and UNC cases, argument starts later this month. And we expect a decision um, probably June sometime next year. And we better get ready because I don't imagine that we will not see some overturning, if not all, at least of the use of race-based um, decision-making, which is already limited. I mean, this is not just you go in and make decisions, but it's, it, it's allowed in college admissions as part of a greater whole. 
And this is this is a real problem. I mean, we we submitted Am um, Wellesley along with Amherst and a number of other liberal arts colleges um, submitted uh, a brief, an amicus brief with um, together about this issue. And Amherst has done some really important work looking at if they totally removed race at all as a consideration um, that the, the makeup of their class would be quite different. And we've seen the natural experiment out in California for this. Um, so we are entering a time where we're gonna have to really think about how we make decisions, um, what are we going to count, and how are we gonna move forward given what we are expecting will happen. I don't have the answers, but we really have to put our heads together to think, uh, to think about this. Yeah, thanks for bringing that to our attention. I think that's something really important that we'll be discussing a lot more in the future for sure. Um, my next set of questions, we'll start off with Dr. Johnson, um, have to do with um, informal networks, specifically in like work and educational settings. Um, so it's a series of questions. So I'm just going to read um, the start first. Are there barriers preventing men and women from socializing and is supporting each other in a way that contributes to disparities? Do men and women, different networks affect um, career and promotion opportunities? So I think we really addressed a good part of that. Um, but what I would, I, the only thing I would add is we're talking about the explicit and I would think about what is implicit or hidden. And I think that's where there's a difference. Um, there's a difference when, and, and this isn't, this has to do a, a bit with networks, but it is when you're viewed as a potential leader or viewed as a potential successor and how you then might be introduced or brought along in subtly very different ways, but that are not obvious. And I think that does happen. We know that it happens. Um, David Thomas, a, a fabulous um, Harvard Business School professor who um, is now the president of Morehouse, uh, college in Atlanta, but he wrote a book a number of years ago called Breaking Through that was really, it was a study of Fortune 500 companies and how executives got to where they got to. And what he explicitly showed through research was that the way that white men in particular were brought along was quite different than other groups and that therefore the trajectories were different. Um, and I think we have to think about that. The, it is implicitly until we get, and not all women are gonna be supportive of women. So let me just say, just having women in leadership isn't as though that is the full answer, but by having more and by having more diversity, we will tend to look at others in front of us and, and, and recognize talent amongst both the men and the women, and those of different backgrounds. So again, it's when you have that difference in leadership decision-making roles, we can tend to nurture, connect, and bring people forward in different ways. And I think if we're all more cognizant of that, then we might do better and have more equitable roots networks, because networks are frequently introduced through mentors or those ahead of you. I have a follow-up question for you actually regarding that. So how is it a little bit different perhaps at a, a school that has an all-female cohort like Wellesley College? Well, for the students, I mean, it's, it's pretty clear. I mean, it's phenomenal for the students. You know, our students leave Wellesley where every leadership role is held by a woman. There's no question. You know, we've done studies, for example, in economics where um, if you compare what happens uh, at Wellesley versus uh, a, a, a partnering co-ed institution, um, you know, where you might drop out of a particular field, economics is the one we've, we've really looked at. Whereas at Wellesley, you might drop out, but if you get, let's, let's just say your first grade is a B minus or a C, you might persist at Wellesley and do well. Whereas at a co-ed institution, you might drop out. Mm -hmm. 
So I think the opportunity to see yourself succeeding is much broader. And the fact that over 50% of our faculty are women in very male dominated fields allows our young women to imagine themselves, I think very differently. Now, let me just talk about the faculty because I think that's different. 50%, over 50% of the faculty are women. And I strongly believe that even with that, that kind of parity, that we still have to focus on making sure that the opportunities for women's advancement, the way they're moving towards tenure, the way they're moving towards that professorial appointment, the way they are recognized, the way that they are often asked to do, un, we had this discussion earlier today, unequal service, the way that they are burdened out of the goodness of their heart because students are coming to them always and particularly women of color faculty. What does that do to their ability to, to get promoted? These are serious inequalities that occur and we're working on ways to recognize that, that unpaid or unrecognized labor. We, we're working on really studying deeply kind of the trajectories what are the opportunities for exposure? So just because we're a women's college, I think we really, us in particular, because we're the examples, right? I, that, that if we don't focus on the equity amongst our faculty and the opportunity, then who will? So there, it's, it's a very clear piece of the work. Great. Thank you for sharing all the work you've been doing with us. I really appreciate it. I think we're now ready for some Q&A, perhaps. Do we have any from either in the room or in on the chat? Um, yeah, there, there's, oh, there we go. Hi, um, my name is Leslie Castro-Alcina, PMP program here at RFU. Um, I had a few questions about um, the research, um, particularly you spoke about um, pain being felt differently by women and um, men. And I just, I can't help but wonder how the societal norms play into that. Um, is it that they're experiencing the pain differently or is it that they've been taught to not complain, right? Um, and I think that also brings, it's not just like, like a physical part, but a psychological part into it. Um, and, and how does research really um, uh, address that? Great questions. I think those are fabulous questions. I don't think we know the answers to those. Um, we do know that there is this societal kind of like women, they are weak or women, you know, they're in pain. And, and, and there's some research that shows that uh, when women go and complain about pain, they're not as believed as much as uh, men. And many women can tell you those stories. Um, so I think we really need to look at, you know, the psychology of, of pain, the biology of pain, sex differences in, in all those areas to really understand uh, what's going on. I, I do also agree that that's a, a really excellent question. And one of the biggest topics that comes up in addressing this is the concept of resilience. We think about, oh, you know, they're handling all of this. They're still able to get all these things done even though they're experiencing this pain or whatever other things are bothering them. But should they be, right? Should we be uh, addressing their issues regardless of their ability to overcome by the skin of their teeth? And then it gets back to the medications, right? And the research on the medications. Uh, oftentimes the medications work much differently in women and dosages are different. And so there's lots of research that needs to be done on, on that whole area as well. If I can just ask a follow-up question, because that sort of touches on something that I'm interested in and which your keynote um, provoked was, I mean, you talked about sex effects and gender effects. And particularly, for example, with the, with the um, 
maternal mor mort morbidity and mortality, which is just so so distressing and shocking uh, for for black women. And obviously, that's clearly uh, you know sociocultural factors and a lot of bias in the healthcare system. And I was just wondering what your impression is about what's what's the lowest hanging fruit for addressing women's health disparities? Is it gender? Is it sexism? Is it, you know, physician bias? Or do you think is it is it more biological? Is it more on the on the sex different side? So it's a good question. And I, I really don't think we have to choose. Because if I think, if you think about the first and if, if I had three main areas that we need to address, but if you look at that foundational area of research, research across the board is both clinical as well as basic and, and everything in between, right? Um, from healthcare delivery, um, which the science of healthcare delivery, which would maybe get more at the gendered aspects of, of of disparities um, to more of the clinical, which is a combination. And then the basic, which is much more biologic, but let's face it today with the whole knowledge of epigenetics, we have a tremendous amount to understand about the impact of environment on, uh, on, gen on genetics and how that is then passed on. So I don't know if we should choose. What I do think we should do, though, is foundationally include the questions in research and, and then we'd move it all forward. Because I think that they are, that, that it's both. And they're so, so for maternal mortality, for example, for black maternal mortality, well, we know some of the biologic risk factors that we need to deal with, but those are so intertwined with the social determinants of health, and quite frankly, um, the behaviors of the healthcare system. Um, and I just, again, urge you to read Linda Villarosa's article from the New York Times, because the stories are harrowing. And, and they're not, these are everyday stories of women um, knowing something is wrong and being ignored. So we've got it across the board. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I, I did read that article in it. And when you think of Serena Williams, the, 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 the difficulties, the near death experience she had with childbirth, it's just shocking. And the fact that she was then denigrated on the tennis court for wearing the longer pants under her tennis outfit because of her deep vein thromboses. And, you know, she got hell for that. So I think you know, this is Serena and it's also Beyonce. And, but that's imagine. So it, you know, I, I think there, there's just so much, so much, and the, the awareness is being raised, but it is still ongoing. And, and that sort of um, takes me to another question that one of our Zoom uh, participants, Jessica Barukham, uh, added about uh, training and assessment on women's health. Apparently it's a mandatory aspect in Britain, um, but I don't believe it really is in the US um, medical schools or, or other health professions. I don't know, maybe PA is different. Um, you know, I think how do we change that? Yeah, that is such a great question. That's what you know, I was trying to uh, talk about earlier is that we really need to be educating our students and residents on these sex differences. Translating, it's not enough to translate research into clinical practice. We have to translate the research into education on clinical practice. Um, you know, we all are excited because over 50% of uh, medical schools uh, include women, right? So we think, okay, we'll get lots of women out there and this will be great, it'll change, won't change because they're being educated by uh, residents or being educated by faculty who aren't um, talking about these sex differences. So it will not translate to change unless we get to uh, what I believe is, is an important component and that is education on the sex differences and, and keep it, and this is an important part of, 
of what you're doing, Lisa. And not just sex differences, but sex sexism. Sex in terms of yes. the way female and male patients are, are treated differently. Yes. That, yep. I mean, I, I know Bianca could go on and on about psychiatry and how, uh, you know, it's kind of DSM is kind of just a Bible of stereotypes, of gender stereotypes. And um, even and even though, um, you know, 50, over 50% 50 of the class, only a third of the practicing physicians out there are women. So, you know, we've got a ways to go. Um, and in orthopedics it, and uh, sports medicine, it's less than 10% are uh, women. And so you can imagine that there are um, a lot of issues there um, in terms of, of exercise and, and what you should do. It's based on men. Mm -hmm. so. Dr. Johnson. I just wanted to say one thing because this, it can feel so overwhelming, you know? So where do we start? Where's their hope? And I wanna give you, I talked about it, but I didn't link all the dots together. We can make a difference. We do have the power to make a difference. So when I talked about that 2014 report that we did at the Connor Center with Kaiser Family Foundation and Jacobs, which Jacobs is no longer in existence, but we did that report and then we, um, we did a big conference, a policy focused conference, and we had a number of people there discussing this. And we invited, um, we invited members of Congress and our members of Congress locally. We, we invited some others, but um, we, we had Elizabeth Warren there. We had other representatives, but Elizabeth Warren was there. And what she said to me was, you know, we will make this different. And it was Elizabeth Warren. And then we took it to a number of other um, uh, people uh, in the halls of Congress. But Elizabeth Warren took that report and she really worked with her staff and then with others to get that GAO report that I talked about done. They watchdogged it. They made, there were a whole bunch of GAO reports that occurred between 1993 and 2015. This one was different because it was actually done in a very, very serious way where, where, where Warren's office would not let them get away with muddying the data. And then they came out literally in 2016 with the GAO report, which said the NIH wasn't living up to the intention of the law. And I bring, and that then led to the biologic, the sex as a biologic factor, and it, it led to other changes. Now, I'm not crediting our work with that. What I'm saying is we have the power of putting our heads together and thinking about how we make change in a way that's beyond our institution. And that's just one example, but I think there are many others. So by working, doing this work through our associations, through our peers, we do have the power to raise awareness and really get a train moving down a track that was not moving before. I just want to add, you know, these are really high level places where you can make the changes, but they can also happen right at bedside, right in the classroom. And, you know, pushing and encouraging our students to explore and find out their interests, asking the questions, you know, that uh, are going to move us forward. I think that's going to be huge as well as the big changes. Too. Okay, cool. I didn't see a hand. Did you have a question? Yeah. Hello, thank you. I've been very inspired as I'm sure others have been by your comments and the progress you're making in your fields um, to sort of following on Dr. Johnson's point. Um, as you think about the future in your professions or your specialties, um, interested to hear a bit about 10 years, 20 years from now, um, what those kinds of opportunities and paths might look like for men and women um, who are pursuing careers. <laughs> um, so I think the, the I'm optimistic, um, kind of in a younger generation of scientists that are up and coming. I recently started my own lab here in 2021. Um, and I see that the tides are kind of changing. Um, 
And there's this really this push towards open science and inclusion and an importance is being put upon diversity and students care. Um, there's a big push for this, um, especially in the younger generation. Um, and so I'm hopeful. I think the field is moving in an excellent direction. I know we have a lot to go um, and it is overwhelming, but I think what everyone is saying is correct um, in that if we keep asking the questions and we keep pushing, um, I think we're heading in the right direction. So I'm hopeful. We're seeing a lot of sex difference papers coming out in the Alzheimer's field specifically now and looking at sex specific biomarkers. Um, and so I think it's, it's promising. So I'm hopeful for the future. I'm hopeful for the future too. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. Our, our students are coming to us and want this information. Um, you talked about evidence-based practice and, and our students uh, you know, talking about the importance of evidence-based practice, but this is the place where we can put research uh, into our curriculum, right? The evidence for these differences and uh, really make a difference and really prepare clinicians because we in all different fields, right? Because we have a myriad of programs um, in understanding um, the differences between men and women and making sure that we're, we're treating every patient uh, to the best of, of our ability. And we know men also benefit when we succeed. So it's really a win-win. And I guess I'll just say, you know, I'm, I'm in the young people business. So that's hope, that's hope for the future. And I think we saw it, we see it in your students, we see it in my students, and, um, and that's what we have to keep focused on. And the, the one thing I would say is that as we think about changing concepts of gender, that, um, that there's room in this work to be inclusive and to think about how we do research on any number of issues and, and the full spectrum of gender and not lose women. And I think that that is gonna be um, very important moving forward because there is a movement to that is working against it. And it's gonna be important that we find a way to expand, be inclusive and ensure that women are really looked at um, as a population. All right, great. And on that note, I'm going to get us ready to wrap up. So thank you all. I also feel the same. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful and excited for the next 10 years. So um, I'm very glad to have you all here. Um, I'm going to wrap up with some thank yous in just a moment, but I just wanted to reiterate one more time in case you didn't see it on the screen earlier, um, that we also, in addition to our symposium, also have a seminar series. And our first seminar that we have scheduled will be in February, February 1st. It will be at noon central time with Katie Watson from Northwestern's Feinberg School of Medicine. And she'll be talking on the topic of are women still people under the constitution, reproductive justice, women's personhood and the contemporary abortion debate. So I hope you all will consider joining us on February 1st. Um, as far as thank yous, I do have a small thank you gift for Dr. Johnson here. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank yes, thank you. And then as well, um, so I, along with my co-chairs, Drs. Elliott and Sowers, would like to, of course, extend an extra, extra special thank you to our WISH administrative um, team for making this event possible. Um, if you'd like to stand or wave, you're welcome to do so. That is Kara Bass, Amy Hilsey, Jay Moat, Brian Rausch, and Nicole Lurie. So thank you all so very much. I'd also like to extend a thank you to our WISH advisory committee, which is made up of um, faculty and staff um, and students throughout the um, university. So thank you again to our advisory committee. And then finally, thank you to all of our attendees. Um, we hope to see you again at future events and um, we hope you have a lovely evening. Thank you.